Hello, and thank you for joining me for this presentation on my current research into intermediate mass black holes, which I hope you'll find interesting. My name is Richard Pomeroy, and I have recently embarked on an MSc by research, having graduated from UCLan with a BSc in astronomy in 2020. My final year's bachelor's dissertation, I carried out a literary review of the current status of research into intermediate mass black holes, or IMBH. My MSc project builds on this foundation by searching for candidate IMBH using transient archives. In this seminar, I hope to give you a taste of the fascinating world of black holes, first introducing the different types and the astrophysics behind stellar collapse and black hole formation, before concentrating on IMBH, looking at their hypothetical formation processes, detection methods, and reviewing a few strong candidates. After this, I'll take you through my plan for my work in progress research project, including a discussion of the compact stellar systems where I will be concentrating my search and some of the examples of the transient measurements which we could expect from the vicinities of these essentially invisible objects. Most people have heard of black holes. Many are even aware that there are at least two different types, including stellar mass and supermassive black holes. Thanks in part to the exotic nature of these objects, they have captured the imagination of the public and references in popular culture abound. Movie makers and science fiction writers have adopted the black hole as an instrument of both terror and destruction, often glibly ignoring many laws of physics in their desire for a spatial or temporal plot enabler. Indeed, one might be forgiven for thinking that black holes do not exist in reality. So, let's first explore the varieties of black holes that we know about. Stellar mass black holes with masses between 3 and 100 solar masses, arise from stars which have depleted the hydrogen and other fusionable elements in their interiors. As gas pressure from fusion energy in the core of the star no longer supports their mass against gravity, a catastrophic event known as a supernova occurs, and if the mass of the remnant after this event is more than about 3 solar masses, it would collapse to a stellar mass black hole. General relativity descriptions of black holes were arrived at before the earliest detections of extrasolar X-ray emissions by Boyer et al. in 1965, which included the first stellar mass black hole, Cygnus X1, a recent Chandra X-ray image of which is shown. Even so, many decades of observation of Cygnus X1 and its companion star were required before the uncertainty of the mass of the compact X-ray source was reduced to the current value of about 15 solar masses, confirming it as a black hole and famously ending a wager between Stephen Hawking and Kip Thorne as to its nature. To date, the number of confirmed stellar mass black holes is only about 20 to 30, most of which are in the Milky Way galaxy, which in astronomical terms is on our doorstep. This gives some indication of the difficulty of detecting solitary black holes. Supermassive black holes have a mass over one million solar masses and were discovered around the same time as X-rays from stellar mass black holes were initially detected, although supermassive black hole emissions were first observed at radio wa wavelengths by Martin Schmidt in 1963. The luminous radio source 3C273 was initially thought to be a star because of its optical luminosity at magnitude 12.9 but was later determined from hydrogen emission lines to have a redshift which placed it at a luminosity distance of 749 megaparsecs, or about 2.5 billion light years. This means if 3C273 was located at 10 parsecs, or about 33 light years from the Earth, it would be as bright in the sky as the Sun. It was subsequently named a quasi-stellar object, or quasar, and was determined to be the core of an active galaxy, i.e. an active galactic nucleus, or AGN, with a jet pointing nearly towards the Earth. Many quasars at high redshifts and AGNs have been discovered since 3C273, mainly through surveys such as the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. 
Their high luminosity is explained as emissions from accretion disks and collimated jets around nuclear supermassive black holes in the centres of their host galaxies. Accretion disks are highly efficient at extracting energy from matter falling into the gravitational potential well of a black hole. The energy from the accretion is also thought to accelerate some of the ionised matter into the collimated jets when they exist. SMBH have been shown to be at the centre of most large galaxies, such as M87, as seen in the groundbreaking Event Horizon Telescope image, produced by a collaboration involving teams from all over the world, including UCLAN's own Professor Derek Ward-Thompson. The main picture here shows an infrared image of NASA, from NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope of the whole of M87, with the first inset showing a close-up of the shock waves produced by the jets emanating from around the black hole. The now famous radio interferometry image of the black hole is shown in the second inset. The black holes at the centre of galaxies are so massive that they are thought to, to have an impact on the evolution of their host galaxies. There is also evidence that the growth of the galaxy will influence the growth of the nuclear black hole i.e. there is a co-evolutionary feedback mechanism which links the two. Later on I will go through from some of these relationships which can be used as proxies to estimate the mass of a galactic supermassive black hole and possibly by extension intermediate mass black holes hosted in smaller systems. So this is the picture we have of the compact objects which we can observe in the universe which we can complete by including the white dwarfs and neutron stars which form from the remnants of smaller stars at the end of their lives. Although still very dense objects, they are different from black holes in that they have surfaces and the escape velocity from these surfaces, although high, would not exceed the speed of light. Our own star, the Sun, will end its life as a cooling white dwarf in about 7 to 8 billion years and we will come across neutron stars later in the guise of pulsars, the radio pulses from which provide some of the most accurate timing signals for measuring gravitational disturbances. You will no doubt notice a rather large gap in the range expected for black holes, and this is where the intermediate mass black holes are thought to be situated and where the rest of this seminar will concentrate. So, now we've covered the context, let's go into detail on the current thinking regarding intermediate mass black holes. As their name suggests, intermediate mass black holes nominally fill the range between stellar mass and supermassive black holes, with masses from 100 to 100,000 solar masses. A key point here is that until recently there had never been any confirmed detections of holes within this mass range. However, in September 2020, a paper was published detailing a merger between two black holes detected by the LIGO-Virgo consortium, with the resultant mass predicted to have been a black hole of about 142 solar masses. As this is the first detection of an IMBH, I'll cover this in a bit more detail later. In more general terms, the mooted formation processes, which I will cover here, include the collapsed remnants of the first stars to form, which are thought to have been significantly more massive than stars in the current epoch. Similarly, primordial clouds of gas may have been so massive they would collapse directly to a black hole. Then there are the mergers in dense clusters that we have mentioned already. As far as detection techniques are concerned, there are several methods employed, including stellar and gas dynamics, which involves measuring the orbits of local stars or gas in the vicinity of the black hole, pulsar timing, which uses the exquisite timing accuracy of millisecond pulsars to estimate the local gravitational profile, reverberation mapping, which involves measurement of the time delay for variations in emissions to model a black hole and its surroundings, uh, there are then indirect measurements including the scaling relationships and what is referred to as the fundamental plane of black hole activity. With the recent detections of black hole mergers, I'll discuss gravita gravitational wave observatories as well. Okay, let's go through the formation processes in a bit more detail. 
Let's start by talking about the formation of intermediate mass black holes from the first stars, which are referred to as population 3 or POP3. The diagram here shows the relationship between the initial and final remnant masses for POP3 stars, as these stars differ to those which form in the current epoch. Now, the reason they are different is that, is that these first stars formed from the raw materials available at the time, and those were the elements which were produced after the Big Bang, through a process called primordial nucleosynthesis. The result was about 75% hydrogen and 25% helium by mass, with trace amounts of lithium-7. The other thing you need to know is that because of the lack of other elements relative to hydrogen and helium, astronomers have adopted a characteristically simplified view of the elementary structure of the universe in describing all elements heavier than helium as metals, and the abundance of those metals in gas clouds, stars and so on is described as the metallicity. Since stars themselves are the factories for the heavier elements which are distributed throughout the interstellar medium, successive generations of stars will contain increasing levels of metallicity, and so the population 3 stars effectively had zero metallicity. But why is metallicity important? Well, a lower metallicity results in a reduction in the fragmentation of star-forming gas clouds as they go through adiabatic collapse under their own gravity. This is due to the reduced number of cooling pathways available through metal line emissions. This then leads to stars which are significantly larger than those we currently see. Authors such as Larson have argued the viability of stars up to 1,000 solar masses. Reduced metallicity also reduces the incidence of pulsational instabilities and stellar winds throughout the life of these stars and they will therefore be more massive at the point of a final core collapse. The takeaway from this is that any star with a mass over 260 solar masses would have collapsed to an intermediate mass black hole, as seen in the diagram. With a similar reliance on primordial zero metallicity gas, in their 2003 paper, Brom and Laub suggested that the collapse of gas clouds within dark matter halos may cause a sufficiently large mass to collapse directly to a black hole. The viability of this method relies upon a UV-saturated environment to inhibit the formation of molecular hydrogen, H2, removing a further cooling channel for the gas and allowing the collapse to proceed in an isothermal manner. In their 2003 simulation, they showed a gas cloud of over 1 million solar masses would exhibit a largely free-fall collapse without fragmenting into smaller clouds. Due to increasing density, opacity and consequently temperature, they found a supermassive star may form briefly as an intermediate stage prior to collapse to a black hole. Later authors studying this suggest this method could lead to a black hole in the 10,000 to 1 million solar mass range. The problem with this process is the removal of angular momentum. In a collapsing volume of matter, a disk will tend to form with rotation in a plane related to the average angular momentum of the original matter. When a disk forms, instabilities and fragmentation are more likely to occur. Some authors have proposed that global gravitational instabilities throughout the cloud could overcome the rotational support, allowing the collapse to continue to the point that a supermassive star is created. If gas inflow is maintained, the star may avoid a supernova death and the core would collapse directly to a black hole. This could then continue to feed on the infalling material, although eventually the accretion luminosity would exceed the gravitational potential of the inflowing gas and the cloud would disperse. This process is estimated to leave a black hole of about 10% the mass of the original gas cloud. In their 2002 paper, Portuguese Swart and Macmillan outlined a process where a collapsing gas cloud with local instabilities would form dense star clusters in which an intermediate mass black hole may be created. Two possible merger processes were identified as viable, referred to as fast and slow. Both processes rely upon mass segregation within a dense stellar cluster, where there is a tendency for slow-moving, higher-mass objects to migrate to the centre of a cluster through dynamical friction, 
while faster lower mass objects tend to gain energy through the dynamical exchanges and move to higher orbits. In the fast process, a runaway growth will occur if collisions between the highest mass stars takes place in the cluster core before the stars have evolved through the supernova compact object phase. This results in the most massive star in the cluster growing in the core prior to collapsing to an intermediate mass black hole. Portuguese Watt and Macmillan estimate a timescale of less than 1 million years after a core collapse to produce a black hole of 1,000 to 10,000 solar masses. The slow process, outlined in 2002 by Miller and Hamilton, does not require a core collapse to occur, but does require a seed black hole of greater than about 50 solar masses to facilitate subsequent mergers of compact objects within the core. As the cross-section of compact objects is significantly smaller than a massive star, the process is likely to involve binary hardening, which sees the progressive reduction in orbital radius of black hole binaries through dynamical interaction with a third body until a black hole merger occurs. The timescales for this process to produce a 1000 solar mass black hole is estimated at 1 100 million to 1 billion years. In summary then, here are the three main formation methods. It should be noted that formation from population 3 stars or direct collapse black holes, as illustrated in the top and middle methods of the diagram, depend on zero metallicity gases to stop fragmentation of the collapsing cloud into smaller masses, while the third method involving multiple mergers is less metallicity dependent. The maximum mass of collisional products is still limited by metallicity. The conclusion here is that unlike stellar mass black holes, the incidence of intermediate mass black holes forming in the current epoch is low to none, and any observations we make would be a relic black holes from a young universe. So, if they're out there, how do we detect them? Before I go through these detection techniques, it will be informative to go through the anatomy of a black hole and its surroundings, put observations into context. Many, many of you will recognise this as Gargantua, the black hole depicted in the film Interstellar. The director Christopher Nolan went to great lengths to ensure the visualisations were as realistic as possible, and to that end engaged theoretical physicist Kip Thorne on the design. So, I'll use this for our close-in view of a black hole. First, we should define the scale of a black hole which can most usefully be described in terms of the Schwarzschild radius, given as 2gm over c squared, where g is the gravitational constant, m is the mass of the black hole, and c the speed of light. For example, for a 1000 solar mass black hole, the event horizon would be a mere 3000 kilometers radius, about the size of the Earth. The accretion disk is the thin rotating structure that forms of matter that is drawn towards the black hole, Although matter will fall into the gravitational well, conservation of angular momentum will cause a disk to form. Viscous friction will heat the matter on its ever faster journey inwards, radiating higher energies of radiation at ever decreasing radii. When inspiraling matter reaches what is referred to as the innermost or last stable circular orbit, it can no longer maintain a stable orbit and it rapidly decays into the event horizon. A similar boundary exists for the massless photons, called the photon ring, or photon sphere, which is the radius where photons are forced to travel in circular orbits. For a non-rotating black hole, the event horizon is the same as the Schwarzschild radius, and is the point at which the escape velocity equals the speed of light, and hence neither light nor matter can escape after this point. It should be noted that this is not a physical surface as such, and any suitably protected space traveller, although foolhardy, would not notice the transition through the event horizon towards the singularity at the centre of the black hole. The singularity, as described by general relativity, is the notional point of zero volume and infinite density at the centre of the black hole where our current understanding of physics breaks down, so we won't go further into this today. 
the accretion disk's far side can be seen overarching the black hole from this angle, and the underside of the disk is also lensed due to extreme gravity surrounding the object, and can be seen underneath, but perhaps a NASA illustration shows this better. This view shows a changing perspective of a black hole and accretion disk, rotating through the disks and poles. The light from the far side of the disk is lensed around the object, making it visible from all angles. You'll also notice the left-hand side of the accretion disk rotating towards the observer is brighter due to an effect called relativistic beaming, which amplifies the light received from a source due to the speed of emitting particles towards an observer. Although many observations can assist in the identification of an IMBH, ultimately conclusive proof relies on, upon confirming the mass of the compact object. The most reliable method available is to use the orbital mechanics of stars around a black hole. From this, a picture can be built of the mass required to induce the motions observed. These motions are illustrated in these videos of the Sagittarius A stellar group surrounding the 4 million solar mass supermassive black hole at the centre of our Milky Way galaxy. The images and animation on the left were created by Professor Andrea Gaze and her research team at UCLA and are from data sets obtained from the WM Keck telescopes over the last 25 years. The video on the right is built from actual images from the European Southern Observatory's very large telescope, the VLT, in Chile. It is interesting to note that the orbital motions of the stars show no particular sense of rotation. We'll go through the relevance of this next. Also, the centre of our galaxy is only about 8 kiloparsecs, or 25,000 light-years away and resolving individual star motions in the reduced volume affected by the mass of smaller black holes, which are further away, is currently impossible. So, let's look at some other approaches. As we noted, the orbital motion of the stars in the last slide was unordered and showed no particular sense of rotation. This is typical of pressure-supported environments such as globular clusters, elliptical galaxies or the bulges of spiral galaxies. The range of velocities or of stars or gas in these pressure-supported systems is known as the velocity dispersion, sigma, and will manifest as a broadening of the spectral emission and absorption lines from the source, such that the greater the velocity dispersion, the larger the range of velocities and hence the broader the Doppler shifted light for particular lines. The presence of a black hole will result in a gravitational potential which will affect the volume of space around the compact object, a region known as the sphere of influence. And in this volume, the velocity dispersion of the stars will be greater than would be expected if the black hole was absent. This effect is used in a technique known as stellar dynamics, which models the motions of stars within the black hole sphere of influence to build a picture of the velocity profile of stars both from the broadening of stellar emission lines to give, the, give line of sight radial velocities and astrometry to give proper motions tangential to the line of sight. The observed velocities are compared to a profile modelled on the central mass distribution. The figure here shows an example of this from Lutzengorf et al. on their observations of the local globular cluster NGC 6388. The radius of the sphere of influence is approximately, approximately related to mass as shown, and for a maximum intermediate mass black hole mass of about 100,000 solar masses, this would be very much less than one parsec meaning stellar dynamics are detectable only for objects inside the local group. For instance, NGC 6388, modelled in the image, is only 32,000 light-years or 10 kiloparsecs distant. Gas dynamics is similar to stellar dynamics, using different emission and absorption lines, and has the advantage that it can extend closer to the Schwarzschild radius, although the lighter gas may be disturbed from Keplerian orbits, so modelling may not be as accurate. Millisecond pulsars, or MSPs, 
are highly magnetized fast rotating neutron stars with a period of less than about 10 milliseconds. The beams of electromagnetic radiation they emit are seen as pulses by an observer due to a misalignment between the magnetic and rotational poles. They are thought to be older neutron stars which have been spun up by accretion of matter with angular momentum from a partner as shown in this NASA animation. This is a view consistent with their occurrence in densely populated environments like globular clusters where a neutron star capturing a partner has a higher probability. As an example, 47 Tuck, the second brightest globular cluster in the sky, contains 27 MSPs and has been extensively studied. As we saw earlier, due to mass segregation effects, compact objects such as these are more likely to sink to the core of a stellar cluster. It has been hypothesized that the accurate timing signals from these extraordinarily fast but stable rotating objects may be used to determine the acceleration of the object on its orbit through measurement of the rate of change of the rotation period. Given enough MSPs within the central volume of a cluster, a density profile can be modelled for that volume, for which a mass estimate of a putative black hole can be made. The question is how do we detect black holes at greater distances? If a black hole has an accretion disk, then, as this illustration shows, there will be a range of wavelengths of light emitted from the accretion disk due to the action of viscous friction and turbulence as matter spirals towards the event horizon. The emissions from the disk are effectively centrally produced and, as they travel outwards, will stimulate gas in clouds within what is known as the broad line region, or BLR. In turn, these gases emit light of specific spectral lines, but by definition this gas is within the sphere of influence of the black hole and, as we have already seen, it will have a velocity dispersion dependent on the mass of the black hole and the distance of the clouds from the central continuum emissions. The emission lines observed will be broadened due to their velocity dispersion, hence the name of the region. This effect is exploited in a technique known as reverberation mapping. It was first used on distant quasars to allow determination of the mass of the black hole through estimation of the radius of the BLR from the time delay between correlated variations in the intensity of the continuum emissions and BLR emissions. On the assumption gravity dominates the gas motion, the black hole mass is as shown in the equation where, according to Peterson and Benz, F is a virial factor based on the geometry, kinematics and orientation of the BLR to the observer. The advantage of this technique is that it can be used for galaxies and clusters where the nuclei is too bright, or distances are too great to allow resolved spatial dynamics to be carried out. The disadvantage is that not all black holes have accretion disks, and those that do may not have sufficient variation in output intensity to allow measurement. Also, sufficient sample cadence of both the continuum and line emissions are required to ensure a correlation of the variations, when present, may be completed. If a black hole is accreting sufficiently, then a jet may form. In their 2003 paper, Maloney et al. noted that there is a relationship between the luminosity of the radio emissions from the jet, the luminosity of the X-ray emissions from the accretion disk, and the mass of the black hole. The image here is an example of what is known as the fundamental plane of black hole activity. If we rotate the image about the plane, there is an obvious gap between the stellar mass black holes shown in black and the supermassive black holes in various host galaxy types. This suggests the relationship between radio luminosity, X-ray luminosity and mass is continuous through a large mass range covering several orders of magnitude, encompassing the objects we have met previously, such as Quasar 3C273, Sagittarius A star and Cygnus X1. Estimation of black hole masses using this method relies upon not only the black hole having an accretion disk, but also accurate models of the accretion to jet powering processes, which at present are not clearly understood. The fundamental plane is an example of an indirect method of inferring and estimating the mass of a black hole from other measurements. 
There are many other indirect methods, including scaling relations, which, impl which strongly imply a coevolutionary link between nuclear black holes and their host galaxies. As we saw earlier, velocity dispersion is a measure of the spread of velocities throughout a pressure-supported system, such as an elliptical galaxy or a globular cluster. The relationship between velocity dispersion in larger objects and the mass of a central supermassive black hole was noted in 2000 by Ferraris and Merritt, and more recently has been applied to putative intermediate mass black holes in globular clusters by authors such as Lut Lutkendorf et al. in 2013. Their results are shown in the left-hand graph here. Similar relationships also exist for bulge mass and bulge luminosity as shown in the centre and right graphs, which can be achieved relatively simply from photometrically calibrated images of galaxies and clusters of the type that might be obtained, for example, from the Hubble Space Telescope or the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Although these mass and luminosity measurements do not require spectroscopic observations, the latter relationships show more scatter, indicating a less tight correlation than velocity dispersion. These relationships are easier to measure, especially with larger galaxies, in which supermassive black holes are thought to reside, and although they have been tentatively extended to the less luminous lower mass ranges, further observations and data from lower mass galaxies and clusters are required to validate the form of the relationships into the intermediate mass black hole range. There are other scaling relationships which have been identified which are more applicable for spiral type galaxies, referencing total galaxy mass or pitch angle of the spiral structure. A new era of gravitational wave astronomy began in 2015 with the first detection of the gravitational emissions from merging black holes by the LIGO-Virgo network of laser interferometers. Gravitational waves are literally ripples in the fabric of space-time and the interferometers set up all over the globe are designed to detect these ripples. As shown in this LIGO animation, the interferometers work by splitting a laser beam along two 4 km arms perpendicular to each other. Mirrors at either end bounce the light waves back to the source. This re reflection process repeats 300 times. The light from both paths is, is combined after the 1200 km journey and ordinarily interference between the two recombined waves destructively interferes, resulting in zero output. However, when a gravitational wave traverses the arms, the path length, greatly exaggerated here, will be stretched for one arm and squashed for another, causing a misalignment in the coherence of the laser waves received, and the observed flickering in the detector output is a function of the frequency and amplitude of the gravitational wave detected. While I could spend a whole session just on this session, I would note that the instrumental sensitivity required to detect the passage of a gravitational wave is about four orders of magnitude smaller than the size of a proton, and its success is nothing short of an engineering miracle. These then are a few of the methods used to try to detect a black hole, some directly measuring the effect the black hole has on its surroundings, and some indirectly inferring the presence of a black hole from other measurements. For brevity, all these methods have observational advantages and disadvantages, making them suitable for objects at different distances in different environments, especially if surrounded by an accretion disk or other stars and gas or even millisecond pulsars. It can be argued that scaling relationships have the best observational efficiency, but a more accurate understanding of galaxy and cluster coevolution with nuclear black holes are still required to improve the robustness of black hole mass estimation. Detection of black hole mergers via gravitational waves are singular events. This makes it challenging to gain extensive scientific insight without follow-up electromagnetic observation. But now we're at the end of our detection section, so let's look in a bit more detail at the detection of merging black holes which created an IMBH. As I mentioned earlier, 
In 2019, the LIGO-Virgo network of gravitational wave observatories detected a black hole binary merger signal, which was remarkable for a number of reasons. As shown in this simulation of GW190521 and the data figures, a short burst of only about four waves spanning no more than a few tenths of a second is thought to have been created by the merger of 85 and 65 solar mass black holes at a luminosity distance of 5.3 gigaparsecs or about 17 billion light years. The resultant mass from the event is the most massive ever recorded at 142 solar masses, placing it within the intermediate mass black hole range, and this is the first confirmed detection of this type of object. object. A follow-up of the detection was carried out by Graham et al. by searching through the archives of the Zwicky Transient Facility in California. They found a visible transient signal in the right area of the sky associated with a distant quasar. After rejecting natural variability from the quasar itself, they suggest the black hole merger event occurred within the accretion disk of the quasar, and the resultant mass was kicked out of the mass, flaring the gas via a shock front on its way. This is a good example of the use of transient signals, which I'll be looking at in my research and which we'll cover shortly. As we heard earlier, the centres of dense stellar clusters may go through a core collapse, or alternatively a cooling gas inflow onto a seed compact mass, and this makes globular clusters, and as we shall see shortly, compact stellar systems in general, the ideal places to search for intermediate mass black holes. Tuck 47, in the southern constellation of Tucana, is the second brightest globular cluster in the sky, and also one of the most massive. Consequently, at only 4 kiloparsecs or 13,000 light-years distant, it has been extensively studied in wavelengths throughout the electromagnetic spectrum, searching for evidence of a central intermediate mass black hole. For example, using stellar dynamics, Hubble has been used to constrain the upper limit on the mass of a central black hole to about 1250 solar masses, and radio continuum flux at 5.5 and 9 gigahertz was measured by the Australia Telescope Compact Array, from which an upper limit on the mass of a central black hole was also estimated. Due to the number of millisecond pulsars within the core region, MSP timing, as outlined previously, was used to estimate a nuclear black hole mass of 2300 solar masses. As summarised in the right image, Giseltan et al. carried out n-body simulations to infer the highest probability of central black hole mass to accommodate the MSP accelerations measured by the Parkes Radio Telescope over several decades. Nevertheless, an X-ray signature which might relate the radio luminosity to a central accretion disk and nuclear black hole through the fundamental plane have been associated largely with the millisecond pulsars, and other authors have disputed the claim of a putative intermediate mass black hole, arguing system dynamics can be modelled with equal accuracy without the need to invoke the presence of a central mass. The Hubble Space Telescope image here is of the Edge-on Spiral Galaxy ESO 24349. This galaxy is about 89 megaparsecs, or 300 million light-years distant. A highly luminous X-ray source is found about 8 arcseconds from the nucleus of the host galaxy, shown circled in the image. Through modelling of the X-ray spectra of the source, subsequently named HLX1, Webb and her team suggested the emissions come from the accretion disk of a 10,000 solar mass black hole. As HLX1 is a non-nuclear, i.e. central source, Farrell and his team used HST Chandra and SWIFT data to analyse both source and environment of HLX1 in multiple wavelengths, as shown in the figures on the right. They used luminosity, metallicity and age data to fit a model containing an irradiated disk surrounding a young 13 million year old stellar population of about 4 to 6 million solar masses. From this, Farrell postulated this IMBH is a low-mass dwarf galaxy remnant 
which merged with the host galaxy about 200 million years ago. Although further analysis by Webb and her team in 2017 found insufficient evidence to discern this hypothesis conclusively, they admit this scenario is still compatible with the data. Hopefully now you can understand why I find these objects so intriguing. So, let's now move on to my current research. Earlier, we discussed the co-evolution of supermassive black holes and their host galaxies, as hinted at by the empirical scaling relations. Quasars containing supermassive black holes are so luminous they can be observed from great distances. Often, their spectral lines can be shifted significantly to the red end of the spectrum. Known as redshift, the change in the wavelength of light emitted from the quasar is analogous to the stretching of sound waves, known as the Doppler effect, and is caused not by the quasar moving away from us, but by the expansion of space due to the Big Bang, and is referred to as cosmological redshift. As we look to higher redshifts, we are effectively peering further back in time. So, for example, a redshift z equals 6 is only 1 billion years after the start of the 13.8 billion year life of the universe. But why is this important? Authors such as Wu, Morocco and Banados and their collaborators have made observations of billion solar mass black holes a mere 700 million years after the Big Bang. And this raises the crucial question as to how these black holes could have grown so massive at such an early stage. For example, according to Mezcua, continuous accretion at a high rate known as the Eddington limit onto a seed intermediate mass black hole would require around 500 million years to grow a 1 billion solar mass black hole. Many authors therefore believe that the formation and merger of seed intermediate mass black holes at high redshifts is essential to explain the existence of supermassive black holes when the universe was less than 1 billion years old or a redshift of around 7, as shown in the diagram, implying that IMBH are critical components to the assembly of galaxies and, and the cosmos as we currently observe it. During our exploration of possible formation mechanisms for intermediate mass black holes, you may have noted that the different methods result in varying mass ranges, or what is referred to as mass function. The relevance of this is that seed mergers could involve low mass IMBHs formed at high redshift or high mass IMBHs at lower redshift. Detection of IMBHs in sufficient numbers can be used to give insight into formation rates and, as we have seen, detecting IMBH either in the current epoch as leftover relics from the early universe or alternatively at high redshifts through merger induced gravitational waves would clarify the significance of formation methods. Additionally, understanding how the relationship between black hole mass and galaxy attributes such as velocity dispersion, scale to smaller galaxies and clusters is crucial to determine the processes at play during the early formation of galaxies. Therefore, my research will concentrate on looking for relic black holes in compact stellar systems. But what are compact stellar systems? The best way to explain this is by going through a size versus stellar mass diagram for clusters and dwarf galaxies. This will put compact stellar systems into context. We mentioned globular clusters such as 47 Tuck earlier. Globular clusters are gravitationally bound dense stellar objects which notionally have an effective radius of less than 10 parsecs and contain a total stellar mass of less than about 1 million solar masses. They tend to consist of older populations of stars and do not exhibit star formation activity. Their metallicity is low and they have little gas or dust, which correlates with the view they formed long ago and have since used up or expelled all their raw star forming material. Globular clusters are commonly found in the spherical halos of galaxies with over 150 known to surround our Milky Way galaxy alone. At the other end of the scale, the dwarf elliptical galaxies are the lower mass versions of the giant elliptical galaxies. These smooth and featureless galaxies also tend to contain older stellar population, with a notional mass over 10 billion solar masses and radius over 1000 parsec. 
as we move back to lower masses but with only an order of magnitude decrease in radius we find the dwarf spheroidal galaxies as might be expected these diffuse structures are less luminous than their more massive cousins but share many of the same characteristics the emerging gap in the middle of the diagram is where the compact stellar systems lie. The CSS are split into two groups, compact ellipticals and the slightly smaller ultra-compact dwarfs, and cover, cover a mass range from about 1 million to 10 billion solar masses with an effective radius from 10 to 1,000 parsecs. Current thinking is that these compact stellar systems are a composite population of either high mass stellar systems or the remnant cores of low mass galaxies which have been tidally stripped. In a simplified view of the size mass diagram from a 2014 paper by my supervisor Dr Mark Norris and his collaborators, they show UCDs are the high mass end of the growth of normal stellar systems including globular clusters with a maximum threshold of about 70 million solar masses, as shown in the blue area of the diagram. The green ellipse which overlaps this shows a population of galaxy remnants, which have been involved in tidal threshing episodes with larger galaxies. This is where a small galaxy enters the tidal radius of a larger galaxy and loses its less gravitationally bound outer layers. The upper yellow track here shows the result of the stripping of the outer layers from nucleated dwarf galaxies, where only the core would remain, and the lower track indicates the remnants of the bulge from a larger elliptical or lenticular galaxy. The zone of avoidance shown here and on the previous diagram indicates a maximum density measure for both stellar systems and galactic structures, referred to as the surface mass density. Now, globular clusters have long been considered ripe but challenging environments to search for intermediate mass black holes, resulting from multiple mergers in the cores of the dense clusters. Dwarf ellipticals are considered the low mass end of elliptical galaxies, which generally contain supermassive black holes. Compact stellar systems, then, which bridge the gap between these two structures, are a prime hunting ground for IMBH. The composite population of overlapping objects which have formed through different processes are interesting as we would expect to see a number of differentiators in their characteristics including nuclear black hole mass. Putting it another way, the central black hole within a stripped nuclei is likely to be significantly larger than that contained in a high mass cluster of similar size. As we discussed earlier, in dense clusters, mass segregation will cause more massive stars to mig in migrate inwards over time. Now, if there is a central black hole in the cluster and a star ventures too close to the compact object, where too close is defined as the tidal radius, RT as shown, then the gravity of the black hole will overcome the self-gravity of the star and disrupt it extending the gaseous envelope of the star as illustrated in this simulation of a 1000 solar mass black hole disrupting a 0.2 solar mass white dwarf. It is thought that this process, known as a tidal disruption event, or TDE, initially produces a brief high energy accretion flare from bound gas, while unbound material is ejected from the system. Approximately 50% is thought to settle into an accretion disk and is consumed over time. The probability of detecting these events and many other transients is increasing with the advent of time domain astronomy through the use of robotic telescopes, global networks and greater computing power allowing automated data analysis. For example, optical surveys include the Zwicky Transient Facility which uses the 48-inch telescope on Mount Palomar the PANSTARS survey for transients in, in Hawaii, and the All Sky Automated Survey for Supernova, or ASSASSIN, which is a global network of 24 telescopes surveying the whole sky every night. Some of these automated time domain facilities have been online for a number of years, with data quality increasing and temporal archives for astronomical objects continuing to amass. In addition, much of the data is available to researchers through publicly accessible databases. 
This then is what I've proposed to, proposed to use for my project by collating a catalogue of compact stellar system sources and, after researching in more detail the expected emissions from tidal disruption events around intermediate mass black holes, I'll be looking to set up a search algorithm to match CSS to transient variations which would be expected from TDEs, with any luck matching it across different wavelengths of light. Having identified candidates, I will then be in a good position to put forward a follow-up proposal for observing time to provide additional evidence for the existence of an intermediate mass black hole in a compact stellar system. So, in this talk, hopefully I've given you a flavour of what intermediate mass black holes are, as well as why they're important to help answer questions about the formation of supermassive black holes early in the life of the, gal of the universe and, by association, the genesis of the galaxies which host them. We've also been through where IMBH may be located and some of the techniques used to locate them. I'm only at the beginning of my research to date, but in the near future I hope to find a hint of these invisible objects so that more focused follow-up observations can be carried out. So, this is the end of my talk, and thank you for listening.